to talk this morning about spirituality in the marketplace. I want to talk this morning that the greatest place where you and I can, can share our faith is in our everyday activities. Not trying to drag somebody into a church service or not trying to get a group together and have a little Bible study, but living our spirituality in the workplace, in our committee, in our school committee, by the answers we give, the words that we say, by how we conduct ourselves. Very important. It's a great place, the marketplace and spirituality. How I want to start this morning, though, is that whenever I'm listening to somebody preach, there's one word, there's one word I keep my ear open for, and it's the word how. If someone's talking about growing in God, I, think, I hope he says how. Or somebody's talking about uh, finding a, a, a good relationship in your family, I hope he says how. Or about how to, um, how to hear the voice of God for guidance, how. And that's important that, that what we hear in the way of truth coming to us, we are involved in learning the mechanism of it so that it will be at work within our lives. Jesus did that, of course, as he was traveling with his disciples. From time to time, they would be asking him questions and they'd be asking the how. And so he would tell them a parable, something they'd have to get themselves engaged in to work out. Or maybe it would be simple, like when they were talking about prayer. Then the how that Jesus gave was, well, look, here's how you pray. This will help you praying to God. And he taught them our Father who was in heaven. And then when you read other passages of Scripture, you'll begin to find this how coming out. Begin to look for it. For instance, Paul, when he's writing to the church at Ephesus in the book of Ephesians in chapter 4, Paul is writing and saying, put off the old man, be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and put on the new man. Put off the old, put on the new. And then if you're asking, well, how do I do it? Paul very graciously, immediately after he says, put on the new man, he then gives seven attributes of how to live like the new creation God wants us to be. He talks about generosity. He talks about uh, being people uh, who, who are forgiving, being people of integrity, and the list is there. Very important, the how. Now, the passage of Scripture today that I've been given to speak on is Mark chapter 6. And that passage of Scripture, Jesus is giving his disciples a how. He's giving them the how on how to share their faith, how to communicate their faith. The disciples had been following Jesus in numerous places, listening to him, and from time to time he would give them answers about how to pray and how to, how to follow him. But now there comes a time when he's getting really into it and he's telling them, and if it's up there, I'm going to turn it on. Who's going to push the button in the back? Here we go. Let me have it. It's coming. I know. Everything comes to those who wait. Blessed are they who expect nothing. They shall not be disappointed, but I'm waiting. <laughs> Here it comes. I know it's coming. Mark chapter 6. Oh, here we go. Mark chapter 6. This is Jesus' how. He's telling his disciples, here's how you share your faith. Here's how. Jesus called his 12 disciples together began sending them out two by two, giving them authority to cast out evil spirits. He told, he told them to take nothing for their journey except a walking stick, no food, no traveler's bag, no money. He allowed them to wear sandals, but not to take a change of clothes. Wherever you go, he said, stay in the same house until you leave town. But if any place refuses to welcome you or listen to you, shake its dust from your feet as you leave to show you've abandoned these people to their fate. So the disciples went out, telling everyone they met to repent of their sins and turn unto God. So that's how you do it. If you want to know how to communicate your faith next week, I'll break it down a little for you. Take someone with you and expect to cast out demons. Wear sandals on your feet and don't just uh, take the clothes and, 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 and just the clothes you're standing up in. Don't waste time with people and if they don't listen to you, well, tell them you're in for a bad time. And lastly, tell everyone, repent of their sin and turn to God. It's quite clear. We could close now, I'll say a prayer and we'll go and have our coffee. That's what Jesus said. The only problem, it won't work in, in 2015. Am I questioning what Jesus said? Not at all. When the gospel is communicated, there is the truth of the gospel 
But there's also the culture that is involved in it. There's the message and the method. There's the principle and the practicalities of its outworking. And what, and what is, if we take that from 30 AD, and that suited 30 AD very clearly because the culture was open to everything that Jesus is giving instruction on there. But in 2015, here's the same truth translated in the day in which we live. Let's influence our community with the authority God gives us. Then, let's trust God for everyday provision and necessities. Have a confidence that God will provide for us. If we go out with confidence, it enhances the way we bring the message. Look for opportunities to speak to people willing to listen. If people are not willing, it's not a waste of time because a little bit of seed goes in their life, but find people that are genuinely interested and show people by our words and our actions how to turn to God. Show people by the way that we live how to turn to God. What I want to introduce is the thought of spirituality in the marketplace. Spirituality, the way that we live. The good things God has done for us, we share with others. Not religion in the marketplace. Thank God we haven't got religion. Religion causes more wars than anything else and more trouble. But we have bypassed religion and we've come to encounter Christ by his spirit. And we have formed a body, a body that embraces all others who live by that same spirit. But we're spirituality. And this is, this is how I interpret what I'm asking you to live by spirituality in the marketplace or in the workplace spirituality refers to, refers to the qualities of the human spirit love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness responsible actions creativity all practiced with a desire to bring unity and harmony to ourselves and others around us it is about learning to be more caring and compassionate with neighbors fellow employees with bosses subordinates customers it's about integrity and attempting to live out our Christ-centered values more fully in our everyday living. The marketplace, the workplace, our social dimension and activities, our interaction with family, friends, wonderful place to gossip the gospel, wonderful place to, to talk to people about the great things that God is doing within our lives, sharing with people. Sadly, some people have lost any sense of boldness. But it doesn't take a lot of boldness if we realize that sharing our faith, we, we are naturally spiritual and spiritually natural. We don't hit people on the head with the Bible. We, we, we try to inject conversation that will bring us to a spiritual understanding in the way that we talk to people. Now, why I say that the workplace is a good place for us to share our faith is because, sadly, in many cases, the workplace is toxic. Do you realize that? You'll be glad I told you now. In many places, the workplace is toxic. There's a great lack of compassion, joy, peace. I, here's, a, here's the Herald from the 23rd of July this year, and it's got a photograph. You might have read this. It shows somebody holding a knife behind their back. And this is what it says in the Herald, somebody writing about the workplaces in New Zealand. And by the way, about 50% of people on the last survey, about 50% of people in New Zealand were not happy where they were working and were genuinely looking for somewhere else. This is what the Herald said. I really love my work. Here's somebody talking. I love my work if it wasn't for the office politics. She works in a central Auckland office. I find them tiring and stupid and try not to get involved but sometimes it's really difficult to not get into the game playing. It can be stressful. The workplace environment is where the underlying drivers are salary and status. And when that's the case, there is going to be politics. I am convinced that you and I, if God has touched our lives, are able to bring a greater dimension of understanding for goodness and wholeness in the places where we work. Can you risk an amen to that? It's possible. It's possible. That's a great place to begin our witnessing. Here's another publication. 
the Westpac Bank put out periodically what's called the Red News. And they put out a good paper on social issues. And here's one that they put out on the 28th of May, just, just a month or two ago. And this is titled, The 10 Top Bad Habits Holding You Back at Work. If we're working, then it's a great place to begin to introduce some good things. The workplace is waiting for people with sanity like you and I to begin to influence it for good. It's a great place to begin sharing our faith. This is what the 10 habits of the Westpac. Holding people back at work. One is backstabbing. Two is passing the buck. Three is bringing your personal problems to work. Four is passive aggression. Five is doing the bare minimum. Six is missing opportunities. Seven is turning down chances to improve. Eight is failing to train staff members. Nine is thinking only about the money you can make. And 10 is changing your career because you don't like your job. When I said to you there's difficulty in the workplace, I mean, you've got to believe this. This is being written by people who have an understanding of the workplace. And I'm saying to you, if you and I are in the workplace, it's a great place to let our light shine. Let our light shine before men that people may see our good works and what? Glorify God. It's a great place. Also, I mean, just again, last week I was listening to national radio and there was a man called Professor William Davies from England and he's written a book called The Happiness Industry. And he was talking about sadness and problem in the workplace, absenteeism, lack of productivity. Look, it's all around us. And why I have selected to talk about in the workplace is because you and I, you and I can learn how to be marketplace missionaries. You want to be a missionary? Oh, I can't want to be a missionary, a missionary. Listen, be a marketplace missionary. Be a marketplace missionary. I want to talk about this morning how holistic values of servant character leadership in attitudes and actions will enhance our everyday activities and enable us to show people by the way we live how to turn to God. I mean, let's go back into Mark 6. This really is what Jesus was saying in 30 AD, which is applicable in this manner in 2015. Why have I selected those three statements? holistic values, servant, character, and leadership. Because if we wanted to condense everything that Jesus is teaching and, and somehow bring it all together in some form of easy understanding, those three issues are what Jesus majored on with his teaching. Number one, he majored on teaching people to be servants. Often the question was by his disciples, who's the greatest? And he would say, all oh, the kings of the earth, they want to be great and lord it over others. But if you want to be great, learn to be a servant. Jesus taught about servanthood. And then he spoke about character. He spoke about the godly character, the virtues and values of God. And he spoke and encouraged his disciples to live so that there could be a demonstration of what God was like as people would, would live out the kingdom of God, the principles of the kingdom of God. And thirdly, it goes without saying, Jesus spoke on the issue of leadership, that he would train people so they could, if you have a leader, you have a following. And if you have a following, you can begin to speak into that following and train them that they also may become leaders. Wonderful. And that's what's needed in our marketplace. People who are servants, who have a godly character, and who know something about leadership. Now, because I brought us this far, I'll do this first. I'll just highlight and identify those three areas. A servant begins with the thought, we want to act in ways to assist others. I'll just touch on these three points to make them very clear. A servant begins with the thought, we want to act in a way to assist others. I love one-liners. Here's one to do with servanthood. Find a need and meet it. Find a hurt and heal it. Fantastic. That's a great slogan to have in your life if you want to be a servant. And then what does it mean about character? Character is displaying godly virtues and values in all circumstances of living. Whatever our circumstances of living might be, let us act in such a manner that we are as God before the people, living the principles of God's kingdom. And then thirdly, Leadership, 
Leadership finds fulfillment in encouraging and mentoring others to achievement. <laughs> I remember an environment I was working in once when someone who was a leader was frightened to give too much information out. Do you know why? <laughs> because he stopped being the leader. The key to leadership is to give as much material out as you possibly can and get someone to be better than you are and not be threatened by it. And not be threatened by it. I want to take us for the remainder of our time into a Bible character, someone from the Old Testament, a very ordinary person, a very ordinary person, but he was so mature in God that he knew how to act in numerous circumstances. And that's what I want to convey to us. You and I, very ordinary people, but can we emulate what we see? Can we be people who have such a desire to live demonstrating this servant character and leadership. And I'll throw an illustration in or two on the way. So here we go. I'm going to talk about Nehemiah. Was Nehemiah a servant? Absolutely. I think we all know Nehemiah. Here's Nehemiah chapter 1. In late autumn of the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign, I was at the fortress of Susa. Han and I, one of my brothers, came to visit me with some other men who just arrived from Judah. I asked them about the Jews who'd survived the captivity, about how things were going in Jerusalem. And they said to me, things are not going well for those who return to the province of Judah. They are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates have been burnt. And when I heard this, I sat down and said, thank the Lord I live close to it. No, he didn't, did he? He's actually four months walk. The palace at Shushan where he is is four months walk back into Jerusalem over rocks and problems and thieves and bandits and you know what. And because Nehemiah had a fantastic job, he was cupbearer to the king. He knew the scriptures. He was trained. He was trained in the ways of God. He knew the scrolls. He knew the writings of Moses. He knew the scrolls. He also knew something of the history of the background of the work of God. Where am I getting to? Look, in the job that you've got, it may be fantastic. And you may have an understanding of the scriptures. And you may have an understanding of the working of the church of God. But, but are you optimistically available? When you hear of something, are you willing to say, oh, I can do that? Don't look upon Nehemiah as somebody who went away for a great long time. He's a short-term missionary. He goes away. He, he eventually goes back into Jerusalem, does some building of the walls, and he comes back again, out and in again. But what I'm saying is a key phrase there. Look at it. I've underlined it. No matter with the job that he had, his heart was not just in the job that he had. He was looking to see, how can I be involved in building the kingdom of God? Do you like that? That's important. Short-term mission trips. Team to the Philippines, team into Fiji, team into Europe. Fantastic. You grow, you grow with an accelerated growth when you begin to offer yourself as a servant and say, God, is there something that I can get involved in? And not necessarily overseas. It might be something to do in the fellowship here locally. But having a servant heart, so important. I've worked on the medical mercy ship from time to time and um, I've seen some wonderful things happen. I've seen a, an, an eye person. I've seen a guy doing cataract operations, 14 a day, and he's there for two weeks, free of charge. I had one done a couple of months ago, $3,500. This guy's doing them 14 a day, free of charge for two weeks. Over a cup of coffee one night, I said to him, you're, you're giving a lot of money away. He said, I know. <laughs> he said, do you want to know why? I said, yeah. He said, because I make a lot of money. So two times a year, I try to find a medical mercy ship where I can go and bless poor people and give them sight. Fantastic. That's spirituality in the marketplace. That's taking the gifting that you have and exercising it in such a way that people will see the good works and glorify God who's at work within you. Well, you might say, but I'm not, I'm not a specialist. What can I do? Well, the captain of the ship, Jeremy, who knows Jeremy? Anyone know Jeremy from the, yeah, Marine Reach, lovely guy. Looks like a lovely young guy. When you're 80, everybody looks young. He was in Samoa at Apia, 
and they received a telephone call that uh, a small boat that was bringing two or three people for an operation that afternoon on their eyes for the cataract. The small boat was having a problem. They couldn't get there. That meant that the program was going to be interrupted and they had two or three hours when nobody was going to be in the operating theatre. Well, what did Jeremy do? He could have sat back and said, bless God, I can put my feet up. Oh, everyone will enjoy this. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. Because beating within his heart was a desire to be a servant for God. So he got into the Zodiac and he went onto the shore. He got a taxi in Apia and he went to the marketplace and he started to look for somebody to see if they had a cataract in their eye. You want to hear him tell the story. After looking to try to find somebody, he, he thought he found someone and he began to say, I think you've got a cataract. If you come with me, then, then I, I can get surgery for you. The guy didn't understand, didn't speak much English. He called an interpreter over and the guy began to interpret. He said, he said, if you like, he'll take you to an operation on your eye. Oh, thank you. The interpreter said, I've got a bad eye too. Can I come? Jeremy said, of course. They're going back to the taxi. They're getting in the taxi. And some other guy, a Samoan guy calls out, hey, where are you fellas going in that taxi? And they said, this man is taking us to the mercy ship to operation on our eye. So this guy said, I've got a bad eye. Can I come too? So they get three of them in there. They go back to the ship. One guy couldn't get his eye fixed. He was, a, uh, he, he was an amateur boxer, too much problem. But two people, two people that day had cataract operations and they're walking around Apia right now with sight because the Christian got off his backside and said, what can I do to serve for the kingdom of God's sake with the gifting I've got? Are you hearing me today? Fantastic. God help us. God help us. But not only was he a servant, but he's displaying godly wisdom. This is so interesting. Displaying godly wisdom. In the 20th year, I was serving the king his wine. He had a great responsible position. I'd never appeared sad in his presence before this. The king said, why are you so sad? You aren't sick, are you? You look like a man with deep troubles. I was badly frightened and I replied, long live the king. Why shouldn't I be sad? The city where my ancestors are buried is in ruins. The gates have been burnt down. The king asked, how can I help you? With a prayer to the God of heaven, I replied, if it please your majesty, and if you're pleased with me, your servant, send me to Judah to rebuild the city where my ancestors are buried. Man, that passage of scripture is full of cultural content and historical content. Absolutely. Yeah. I'll talk on each of them for a moment. Here's somebody who knows how to communicate in the marketplace. When I saw that, he replied when the king said, you aren't sad, are you? He said, long live the king. I thought to myself, oh, you con man. <laughs> long live the king. I love the King James Version. Oh, king, live forever. Long live the king. Is that a con? No, it's not. That is a Babylonian greeting. If you read the book of Daniel, you will see Daniel using the same phrase with Babylonians. And that's, that is a great term of endearment and salutation. O king, live forever. See, why am I saying this? Because if you want to be effective in marketplace ministry, you have to learn some of the rules of the marketplace. And communication is important. How many of you, I wonder how many of you are, are at, at ease in speaking with superiors or talking to people? Because you'll never communicate the gospel unless you have worked your way in among the group that you're with. Marketplace ministry. He knew how to speak. O king, live forever. And then look what he says. Why shouldn't I be sad? The king says, why are you sad? He says, why shouldn't I be sad? If you know anything about Jews, if you ask a Jew a question, he'll normally respond to you with another question. Who found that out? Yeah, they were. Oh, King, see, he knows how to communicate. I worked in coffee bar evangelism for about seven years on the street and um, right in the middle of Palmerston North and we had numerous people come into the coffee bar and in my early days of learning to communicate, they would come in and I'd say to them, um, you've been uptown long? They'd say, no. Oh. You going to the movies tonight? Yep. I said, dear Lord, I've got to do better than that. <laughs> <laughs> and I began to learn, if you want to keep a conversation going, and that's what's necessary, 
If you want to communicate your, your faith, don't be afraid to be naturally spiritual and spiritually natural in the conversation going. Begin to ask questions, who, what, why, where, how? And people can't give a yes or no to it. Who, what, why, where, how? See? Yeah. Very important. What did you come into town tonight for? Can't say yes or no to that. Yeah. What did you expect to see when you came in this Christian coffee bar? Yeah. You begin to talk and then you can say, hey, tell me about your spiritual journey. And people begin to talk. Fantastic. Learning the art of, of marketplace ministry, communicating in the marketplace. And then thirdly, another cultural aspect here. Not only is he displaying godly wisdom, he knows how to speak to the king and, and he knows how to communicate. He, he didn't say to the king, when the king said, what shall I do? He didn't say to the king, send me back to Jerusalem to build some walls. The king would have said no. The minute the king heard the word Jerusalem, he, he didn't want to do anything because Jerusalem was known at these times as being a place, of, uh, these Jewish people, they're always, they've got more money than anyone else. They're always trying, they don't pay their taxes. All the bad news, and it was written and recorded in Persian literature, and the Babylonians had it, that don't have anything to do with Jerusalem. So if he'd have said, I want to go to Jerusalem, the king All good? Thank you. Thank you, Craig. That's very kind. Yeah. You are a servant. <laughs> May you live long. <laughs> but what does he say? You see, where he doesn't reply and say, I want to go to Jerusalem. See, he's wise enough in his conversation. He's street smart, and that's what you need to be to communicate among people, street smart. He said, I want, to go, I, I want to go to the city where my ancestors are buried. And then again, will you send me to the city? Didn't say Jerusalem. But then he, said, he also said, where my ancestors are buried. He said that a couple of times. And he knows how to communicate. The Babylonian people, history records, the Babylonian people looked after and very much respected the departed. They looked after the graves. So here is Nehemiah saying, I want you to send me back, not to Jerusalem, to the city, and I want to take care of the graves. He's carrying favor. It's not bad, but he's learning how to communicate. So important. So important. I had somebody communicate to me many, many years ago many years ago. I was in the electrical industry in Palmerston North and it's too long to try and describe what the situation was but it was to do with substation operating and selling electricity and if you, if you had a problem in the control room then you could oversell your supply and if you oversold the supply, each hour supply, you got a penalty rate from the government where you bought your power from. And we had a problem in the in the, um, in, in, you see, I said I wanted to say it. Now I'm, I'm in it. There was a problem in the control room. A technician changed the meter and forgot to put the alarm on, which told you you were getting too close to the cutoff time. Anyway, it so happened a car hit a pole, the police were ringing, people were ringing, and I was very busy. And I never noticed that we were overselling our supply, which meant we're on a penalty rate, and the guy had forgotten to put the alarm on. I thought to myself, I bet I get a ring from the boss tomorrow. I did. I went into his office, and when I got into his office, oh, he said, Jim, take a seat. I thought, man, it, look, it looks good right from the start. Jim, take a seat. I said, yeah. He said, uh, tell me about the trouble you had last night. Notice you didn't say, did you have a trouble? No, yes or no. People know, people who know how to communicate can find favor in what they're saying. Tell, tell me about the difficulty you had last night. Mm. Well, we had a car hit a pole and uh, we had a new meter put on, but I accept responsibility. The alarm wasn't hooked up. I accept responsibility. Uh, if it happened again, tell me, uh, what would you do? And so I began to dialogue and talk to this general manager about what I would do. And uh, they said, uh, are there any mechanisms you feel that can be put in place uh, apart from the alarm which would assist? And so I began to dialogue and talk. 
Then he said to me, you're a good worker. We like you being here. I think it cost about 18,000 pounds for the overrun that we had in those days. But he said, you're a good worker. I like you being here. And as I began to walk to the door, listen, this happened in 1965. Why do I remember it? As I began to walk to the door, he said, oh, Jim. I said, oh, yes, yes, sir, yes, sir. He said, if I had to tell you the mistakes I've made in getting to this position of authority in this business, I'd have you here for about a couple of hours. And as I walked out, I remember what I thought. I thought, I will crawl over broken glass if it's necessary to prove to this man I'm worthy of his trust in me. Fantastic. That's marketplace ministry. You and I have this opportunity to live in such a way that we are able to, to be an encouragement to those around us. That's spirituality in the marketplace. Not stuff in a Bible or attract up their nostril and say, read this. Not saying, have you found the Lord? They'd probably say, I didn't know he was lost. <laughs> if you hear me today, we have a responsibility to communicate the gospel. If it was me, I wouldn't leave it to human beings. I'd get angels to fly low with megaphones. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. <laughs> because I know the fickleness of human beings. But I know that when person of God gets that spark of initiative, you find yourself coming into a whole new dimension of understanding the ways of God. Let's go to the third area. Encouraging achievement in others, and that's leadership. And Nehemiah, Nehemiah goes up the valley by night. He examined the wall. Finally, he turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The officials didn't know where I'd gone or what I was doing. I hadn't yet said no. I'd said nothing to the Jews or the priests or nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we're in? Jerusalem lies in ruins. Its gates have been burnt with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. We will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God upon me, what the king had said, and they replied, let us start rebuilding, and they began this good work. Great leadership principles here. He didn't go on hearsay. He had a look himself. He gets on the back of a donkey. He goes and has a look. So when he comes to the people, he's speaking with authority. But when he comes to the people, and as a leader, he wants to bring encouragement and others. He brought the material back from the king has given him. He's got everything to go, but he needs some workers. Can you see any key words in there? As you look at that passage of Scripture, can you see any key words that are going to give him favor? That marketplace ministry ought to learn. Look at them. Verse 17, I said to them, you can see the trouble. He didn't come and say, listen, you turkeys, why haven't you been building this thing? You've been here years. I've been sent down here. Come on, get going. No, no, no. No, no, no. Because if you love God and you have the spirit of God within you, you will want to encourage people. They'll never go by coercion, but they will by encouragement. And look, you see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins. Its gates are burnt with fire. Let us rebuild the wall. That we, I tell you, they're nudging each other and saying, we can work with this guy. This guy's on our page. We can work with this guy. And if you get to the place, in, in the workplace, of living out the, your spirituality, let you... Light show sign before men that they will see your good works and glorify God. And this is what's necessary. I'm convinced that New Zealand is up to here with people preaching at them. Up to here. But they're still looking to see a godly life made manifest in their midst so they know where to turn when trouble comes upon them. They know where to turn. And so what happens? Let us start rebuilding. And they rebuilt this great and good work. Very briefly, a story here. I pastored Matua Baptist for seven years, and God was very gracious to us. Uh, we employed a youth pastor, and it came to the stage to employ an assistant pastor as well. And our search committee looked around. We had about 10 people to select from, and eventually, 
they chose a fine, fine young guy and his wife. So this first day at Matua Baptist Church, this first day, I said to him, we're going to walk around the suburb. Don't think this is going to happen every day. But we're going to walk around the suburb, have a cup of coffee somewhere. I'll talk to you about this, the suburb. There's 5,000 people, 1,280 letterboxes, and you'll get to know the suburb. As we walked around, I said a couple of things that are very important I need to say to you. I was trying to exercise some leadership, but somehow with God's goodness and grace. I said, the devil doesn't want to work in Matua. We're the only church here. The only, the only established work here. The devil doesn't like it. But listen, we have some very good-looking women in our fellowship. If that worries you from Bethlehem Baptist, I didn't think of, you might have some great-looking women here too. Who knows? But we had some great-looking women in Matua Baptist. And I said to this guy, what the devil wants to do is to try and turn you and cause a problem. We don't want it. We want none of this undercover stuff. Every three or four weeks, I'm going to sit with you and have a cup of coffee and ask how your marriage is. And I'm expecting you to say it's 11 out of 10. All right? All right. And I said, also... I'm giving you permission to ask me how my marriage is. I've got red blood in my veins too, like you've got red blood in your veins. But I give you permission to ask me. He really took that. And then when we're nearly finished at the end of the day walking around, I said, I know you because I taught this guy in Bible school many years before. And I said, I know you. And I said, I'm not going to call you my associate, my assistant, not my assistant. Well, we're going to appoint you as an associate. We're gonna, well, I can see the skill that you have, the desire, the love for God in your heart. You're not an assistant. I'm going to call you an associate. I turned out to be a great guy, great guy. About two years later, somebody came to me who had been in a Baptist meeting of youth pastors. And this guy was one of the speakers. He came in to speak about how to conduct yourself as you're coming as a youth pastor into a church. Two years after, he started with us. And uh, this man said to me, I heard your name mentioned this morning. I said, what? Oh, he said, the chappy who is, your, who is your associate pastor came in and he said how you walked around with him and you said that he was allowed to check you out like you were checking him out. And he said also how you believed the best in him and he told us how he rose with strength within him to do what he sensed that God had given him the opportunity to do. Fantastic. Fantastic. And I'm convinced that there's nothing to stop you and I doing that. Spirituality in the marketplace. Time to begin to close. Servant, it begins with the thought we want to act in a way to assist others. There has to be application. There has to be application. I would like you to sit right now and think, who's somebody I can be a servant to? Servanthood, find a need and meet it, find a hurt and heal it. Don't just look at me and think, yeah, what's the next point? Because I'm pausing here. Who can you think of that you could bless, demonstrate the good works and glorify God, communicate the gospel? This is how the gospel is shared. People want to see how you live before they, they hear what you say. Who can you, who can you bless in the days that are ahead? Think of somebody. Secondly, are you struggling in any area of character? Deal with it. Deal with any area. Is it integrity? Is it responsibility? Is it creativity? Is it forgiveness? Is it generosity? Number one, think of someone that you can assist and put into practice. Second, what area... What area do you think you could work on? And thirdly, find fulfillment in encouraging and mentoring somebody else to achievement. Who could you, who, who could you get alongside? I am convinced that mentoring is one of the greatest ways of seeing growth in an individual. Who could you mentor? Who could you get alongside? Think of somebody. I hear the musicians coming. <laughs> it's 
See, in my earlier days preaching here, someone would hold a sign up or point to the watch. Now they just stick the musos up behind me. <laughs> but they're a good bunch of musos too, aren't they? So let's go through those four points as we conclude. I trust that you've, I trust, I trust you can think of someone and do it, phone them, do it, do something, bless them and work in these character areas and find someone you can get alongside and put an arm around and, and encourage them on their journey of faith. So important. And bear in mind, you and I have been blessed to such a degree, to such a degree. Just imagine what it was like before you knew the Lord. What blessing we've come into, and we need to pass that on. By the way, if you've never made Jesus your saviour, life begins when Jesus comes in. And there are people who are willing to pray with you today. Maybe you need to let your feet cast your vote and say, I've never publicly declared my faith for Christ. Walk to the front while we're singing a final psalm. Here's the four points as we conclude. 2015 AD, the words of Jesus, but put in the language of the culture of today. God, help me to influence the community I'm in with the authority you give me. And Lord, I trust you for everyday provisions and necessities. I'm not going to worry and strive. God, I trust you. I'm leaning upon you. How else do we communicate the gospel? How? Look for opportunities to speak to people willing to listen. You'll tire yourself out if you have people that are not interested. But every now and then, there'll be somebody who's interested. And fourthly, show people by our words and actions how to turn to God. The way that we live is communicating the goodness of God and people will put that back in their memory bank and say, hey, things are getting tough. I talked to somebody many years ago who was not interested in my Christian faith. I tried to talk to them. I even wrote them a 14-page letter after they left me trying to explain the Christian faith. I never heard back from them. Seven years later, that man approached me and said, I'm struggling in the workplace. Do you think your God could help me? I led him to the Lord. Praise God. It took a long time. Live the life that people may know, the light that shines. May the Lord encourage you today with that message. God bless you.